Well, we want to continue our studies in the deeper life tonight, and we have no doubt the end of the age is so close upon us. We have little enough time to prepare ourselves in discipleship. So tonight, our message is Deeper Life Training in Discipleship. Deeper Life Training in Discipleship. Now, I hope you have your Bibles because we want to look at two or three passages. If you have your Bibles, why open to the book of James and then 1 Corinthians 10 and then Hebrews 12. We'll start with James 5 first, James chapter 5. While you're turning there, I want to point out how that the Holy Spirit wants to teach us how to endure trials, overcome temptation, and to submit to chastisement. Now remember we've said again and again the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not to enable you to speak in tongues. That's the evidence, the initial evidence that you have been baptized. That's not the end in itself. And while God loved that praise we just gave, that isn't the purpose of the baptism. That just enables you to do that without working it up or putting on. But we've said, and we've said it time and again, He has come to enable you to pick up that cross and follow Jesus. And a lot of times people misconstrue what's happening to them. They confuse temptations with trials and trials with chastisements and chastisements with trials or temptations. So what the Holy Spirit wants to do is to teach you how to endure a trial, overcome a temptation, and submit to chastisement. A vital part of our spiritual education and discipleship is knowing how to distinguish between a trial, a temptation, and chastisement. Failure to distinguish between these three experiences has resulted in a lot of Christians resisting a trial instead of enduring it, submitting to a temptation instead of overcoming it, and opposing a chastisement instead of accepting it. So I want to look at three passages. Of course, there are many, but these are three selective passages which set forth the biblical distinction between a trial, a temptation, and a chastisement. First of all, James 5, verses 10 and 11. He speaks here of enduring trials. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of endurance. King James' patience, Greek, is endurance. They suffered affliction and they endured. Behold, we count them blessed which endure. You're blessed if you endure your trials. Now, the obverse of that is that God is not going to bless you if you don't endure a trial. You can take any scripture and turn it right around. I didn't say twist it, turn it right around and see what will happen if you don't obey it. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He wants to teach us, secondly, how to escape temptation, or that we should and he will show us how. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You're not tempted, you see, as an angel, but only that common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now anyone who's been through first grade would have to admit there's no excuse for a Christian submitting to any temptation. And then thirdly, if you'll turn to Hebrews 12, we are to accept chastisement. Hebrews 12, verses 5 and following. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. What is the exhortation? He's quoting from the Old Testament. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, he didn't say scourges just those who need it. He said every son. Of course, every son needs it, obviously. 
And if you endure chastening, then God will deal with you as with sons, that is, as his child. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then as the good old King James says, ye are bastards and not sons. Illegitimate probably in the more refined versions, but you get the point. So, from those three selective passages, and many, many like them, we are to endure trials. You're to endure a trial, not try to get out of it. Amen. Overcome a temptation. Not say, oh, I guess I'm going through a big trial, and that's why I'm suffering this in the flesh or whatever. Overcome a temptation and accept, accept, submit to chastisement, divine chastisement. Now we find there's a good deal of confusion in these three areas. A good deal of confusion. For example, and I'm going to give you a lot of them because, you know, examples are what help you. For example, a Christian who thinks that a temptation is only a trial may toy around with the temptation instead of fleeing from it and end up submitting to it. How would you like to counsel with some of the people we do? And then you'd have your own definitions and interpretations. They just come from people. I got all of this from experience, both mine and others. But some people, because they're confused in these areas, think a temptation's a trial. That's what I'm saying. So instead of resisting the temptation, they toy around with it. Say, well, I know this trial will be over someday. Instead of fleeing from the temptation, they play around with it and end up submitting to it. Or a Christian who tries to escape trials as he would temptations instead of enduring the trials, never matures in the faith. How are you going to mature if you run from trials? And some people have very good running shoes from trials. And of course, it's painful, but we have to tell them, you missed at that time, which means you have to take that course over, and generally it's harder. But even if it isn't harder, you can't go on until you pass that test, pass that course. If you keep failing your trials, then God just passes you by. We're talking about end time ministry. Or again, a person who misinterprets chastisement as a trial of faith will never learn the lesson God's trying to teach him through the chastisement because he just thinks it's a trial. He doesn't wake up to the fact that God's speaking to him, trying to awaken him to the fact he needs to change something or do something or not do something or whatever. Chastisement is to wake you up. Do you ever chasten your child and wouldn't tell him why? Well, what's that for, Daddy? Well, you ought to know. Well, I didn't do anything. Or is it something I haven't done? And so God chastens us to get our attention, to see where we're missing him, disobedient to his word or whatever. So frequently in counseling, we have to tell people that they're confusing one of these experiences with one of the others. Now, how can you know when you're not confused about a trial or a chastisement or a temptation? Well, we're going to try to give you some guidelines in this study tonight because this is strictly a teaching message, and I don't know how loud we'll even get like we've been getting lately. Here's another example. Some people confuse toying with temptation as a trial of their faith. People will come to us and in the conversation they're needing help and they tell us things. And for example, here's an unmarried couple. If you're a pastor, minister, you get all sorts of counseling situations. And generally people talk to you like they do a doctor. Of course I am, but not that kind. <laughs> and they think no more of telling their minister personal intimate things than they would their doctor. Well, anyway, so here's a couple, unmarried, out in a car where they shouldn't be, haven't heard our tapes on playing the dating game and all of that, get to necking, and it almost goes too far, but she, by sheer willpower, says start the car and gets the car started and they get home before it goes too far. Now we're mature enough we can talk, can't we? All right. How are you going to overcome temptation if you think it's a trial? And so she says, thank God that he stopped us before it went too far. That was a real trial of my faith, not to let that thing go too far. Well, that wasn't a trial of their faith. 
you can't toy around with temptation when you're supposed to flee it. They were getting very close to trouble because they were playing with temptation. And people, well, so many, I won't say 50%, but probably more than that, often confuse a temptation with a trial. And they'll talk to you about their trials, and they were temptations. I mean, you can't subject your flesh to temptation to see how far you can go with fun before it becomes fornication and call it a trial. You see, you can't say that God's putting you through a trial because you allow yourself to get into some compromising situation that you shouldn't be in. You shouldn't have been out there in the dark with that boy to begin with, or girl. You can't say God is allowing you a trial when you find yourself in areas where you shouldn't be, like where occultism is going on. You know, some people out of curiosity, or down at the bar, or the racetrack, or the X-rated movie to see just how bad this stuff is. So you can preach against it. It's not God allowing your faith to be tried if you allow your mind to dwell on resentment against a person and then, oh, that was a real trial to overcome that. <laughs> that wasn't a trial. You were submitting to the temptation of the devil to think the worst about your pastor, somebody in the church, or whatever. And I say pastor because he's a good scapegoat often. And then other people, we're talking about confusing temptations with trials. Other people will confuse divine chastisement with a trial. Take the person that comes to you and says, Now, I believe Matthew 6.33 that God will supply all of my needs. I'm trusting him too. But I'm having a difficult time financially. And I don't understand it because it's been six years or three years or whatever, and I think things ought to improve by now because others are being blessed in the body financially, and why am I not? And what he doesn't know or her is that in this particular case, I'm giving an example where it's a case like this, they're suffering chastisement because God can't get their attention any other way. They're disobedient about something, or they're not measuring up, or they're just taking these end-time faith messages and deeper life teachings as another sermon from another preacher and not doing anything about it. And so God is withholding His blessings, in this case financial blessing, trying to draw their attention. God is chasing them to try to get them to see what He wants them to see about some other matter, but they misconstrue that as a trial. And then they never learn the lesson God's trying to teach them about withholding financial blessing. So it's very important we be able to distinguish between a trial, a temptation, and chastisement, and that's why the Holy Spirit has come. Another good example is the average charismatic's attitude toward answered prayer. Now, most of us have come out of religious circles where we've been taught all the wrong things about prayer, and it takes a long time to get all of that undone. So the average person prays, let's say, for healing, and there's no answer, because he prayed as he was taught, if it be thy will. There's no place in the Word of God where he ever said to pray about healing, if it be thy will. The prayer of faith will heal the sick. How could be, if it be thy will, heal the sick, and call that a prayer of faith? James 5, the prayer of faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Or Mark eleven twenty four, when you pray, believe you're healed, and you shall see it. Mark eleven twenty four, But they don't follow the word of God, they follow the teaching of man, and so they pray, if it be thy will. And then the healing doesn't come, and they get to thinking, yes, now let's see, what else was I taught? Oh yes, God usually says no. He sometimes says yes and gives substitutes, but most often the best Christians, the most pious saints, will tell us that God says no more than he says yes to get us out of the notion that we want or need anything. I've got a book where the author actually says that, that God doesn't answer prayer so that you'll get out of the notion of wanting it, anything you're asking for. But he wants you to keep on asking until you get tired of asking, he said. God wants you to keep on asking to get tired, and then you get to the place where you get so tired asking, you won't want it anymore. Well, anyway, he gets to thinking now, yes, that's right, I was told that God can say no, usually does. And so he accepts a no. That's the answer. 
putting the responsibility back on God instead of exercising faith himself. But because he's been taught the wrong things, he's never challenged to see that that is not a trial of his faith, but that is chastisement, the failure to get an answer because he doesn't exercise faith in the word of God. You see, no is not an answer. No is no answer. No is never an answer. No is no answer. Yes is an answer. 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God are yes. And amen in Christ Jesus. If Christians only had that one verse, they'd have no excuse for not getting answers to prayer. Assuming, of course, they know and meet the conditions. But 2 Corinthians 1.20 is put there for people to discover who are looking around to see from the Word of God at least why they're not getting answers to prayer. That God didn't say no to His promises. He's already said yes, so how could He say no? So no is not an answer. No is no answer. And so get into your own heart and find out why God is not answering you. He just plain is not answering you because you don't meet the conditions. And that's quite different than saying no. No is not an answer. He just plain does not answer until you meet the conditions. In fact, he says in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, he doesn't even listen unless you pray according to his will. And when you put an if on a promise of God and pray that way, he's not listening. Well, it may be a little hard and harsh for some, but it's true nevertheless. I'll challenge you to do this. The same person that thinks God said no to their prayer will get a yes if they'll get into the Word of God instead of listening to the Word of man. They will discover God did not say no to them. Man said no to them. Because they were willing to believe every Tom, Dick, and Harry rather than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because men are always telling us what God won't do. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us what He will. So if you've asked for healing, if you've prayed for healing, you're not healed. If you've prayed for financial deliverance and you're still in need of finances. If you've prayed for deliverance from some problem and you're still oppressed. If you've asked God for divine guidance and you still don't know what street you live on, you might try doing what it never occurs to most Christians to do. What is that? Try to find out, first of all, if that's a trial you're going through or chastening from God because you're not measuring up to something. If you're not getting answers to all those prayers, why don't you do what most never do? Instead of running back to theology that isn't based on the Bible or asking others, why don't you just get alone with God and let Him show you whether or not that's a trial or a temptation or a chastisement? We're going to show you how to tell that a little later, but you might try doing that to see if it's a trial of faith or divine chastisement. You see, if you've got a temper that you don't control, notice I didn't say can't, but don't control. If you've got bitterness in your heart, if you're preoccupied with everything but the kingdom, if you're guilty, as so many are, of putting last things first, if you've got some habit you're not facing, if the Holy Spirit is convicting you about something and you're turning the other cheek, you know, away from Him, I'll tell you right now, God will withhold blessings. He'll allow you to have financial trials. You'll go through physical upsets and problems like you've never known before. He will allow you to fail in something that you wanted to succeed in and figured you could because you always thought it was your ability anyway. All this forms of chastisement. And those are some of the mild forms. We'll mention some others later. But what is His purpose in doing all of those things? For the same reason that you discipline your children. Because you love them. Isn't that what we read here in Hebrews 12, 6? That God wants to keep you in the right path and doesn't want you to go astray. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourges every son he receives. Why does God allow these things to happen to us? Why does he chasten us? Because he loves us. He doesn't want you to walk any longer in that wrong path. He's trying to get your attention. And you're not listening. If you're not going to listen to his word and his anointed ministry, he wraps you across the knuckles with his rod. 
And then if he doesn't get your attention, watch out. Because God is going to scourge and purge every son he receives. And if it takes taking his life, he'll do that. And we've got scripture for it, which we'll get to in a moment. There are several purposes in divine chastisement, and I dare say most of us have never realized what God is doing. And it's proof that he loves it. Several purposes I want to share with you. First of all, God chastens us in order that it will confirm to us our sonship. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, then God deals with you as his son. You see, you can enter into all the blessings and promises of God which the Father has given us in the Word if you endure your chastening. But if you do not, if you resist it, if you fall away from it, if you give up, if you complain and do not submit to it, you know what that proves? It proves you're not a son. That's what it says right there. It proves you're not in the family of God. It proves you're not eligible for the blessings anyway. That's why you're not getting them. You're not getting them because you're not a son. I noticed it got awfully quiet when I said that, but that's what he said. I'm just telling you what God said. There it is in Hebrews 12. He said, If you be without chastisement, whereof all of us are partakers who are his children, if you be without it, you are illegitimate. So how could you get a blessing of God if you're not his son? And so God's purpose in chastisement, first of all, is to confirm our sonship if we endure it. What's your first reaction when you're being chastened? Answer it for yourself. You want to give a testimony tonight about it? What's your first reaction? Oh, they come to me and say, why do I have to go through this? If they say that to me, I don't know what they're saying to God. Is that your first reaction? You say, but this is serious. Is it more serious than almost being killed yourself and your daughter's brains knocked out of her head because you wouldn't endure the word and do what God said, so he had to chasten you severely? And how would you have responded to that? I ministered this word of faith in a brother's church several years ago. And this happened to him. And his reaction might surprise you. And he didn't have to run to anybody to find out whether there was a trial or chastening or whatever. He said to me, as we were talking about various things after one of the meetings, he said, God, several years ago, told me to come to this city and begin a work. And I ignored it. He said, of all the places in Illinois, this would be the last town I'd want to minister in. So he said, I just ignored it. Now, most of you will know what I'm talking about because the Spirit speaks to you and you know when you've ignored Him. But I'll tell you, this is the end time and if He's laid something on you to minister a word, you better not ignore that. Although, you better not ignore anything He says. He said, I ignored it. And He couldn't get my attention. But I knew what He was saying to me. I didn't want to go to that town and live. Why pull up stakes and go to that town where He didn't want to go? So He said, one day I was driving down the street after... Oh, I don't know, several months when God told him to go to that city and he disobeyed, like Jonah. And he said, a car came down the other intersection at high speed and hit us broadside. Terrible wreck. And said, I was knocked against the steering wheel, broke my ribs. And I was helpless sitting there. He said, my daughter, I think she was two or three years old at the time. She was knocked against the dashboard and broke open her skull. Actually, her brains, some of them came out on her head. What was his reaction? He knew, he said, just like that, what it was. He didn't say, oh God, why did you allow this to happen? Why does this have to happen to me? He said, Lord, I hear you. He said, I'll go. He said, restore my daughter, I'll go. Well, to make a long story short, two days later, that daughter's brains were back in. Supernaturally, it was closed up, total healing and a miracle. She was sitting up eating everything she wanted. In fact, there's no way to explain it except supernatural. In fact, it's a beautiful story. Well, he showed me her picture. She's a grown woman now, married with children. But what would your reaction have been to that? Your only daughter lying there, dying in your arms. A lot of people would say, I wouldn't worship a God like that. They don't. 
And I'll tell you to your face here tonight, if you were thinking that, you don't worship the God of this Bible. If you were thinking, God did that, that isn't God, that's the devil. Well, how come, as soon as he said, Lord, I'll go, and they hauled him off to the hospital and tried to get her in a room where she was dying anyway, just gasping a few breaths, that he insisted on being in the bed with her, with his broken ribs, taped me up. In fact, he put up such a ruckus over it, they finally put them in bed together, said, well, she's going to die anyway. And he laid his hand on her, and for two days he believed God. He said, the second day the angel of the Lord came into the room. If you're not charismatic, you may have a little trouble with some of this heavy stuff, but the angel of the Lord came into the room, and instantly she was healed like that. So the devil, the devil didn't come in as the angel of the Lord and heal her. But anyway, people say, I wouldn't worship a God like that. They don't worship a God like that. In fact, I don't believe they've read the Bible. I don't believe they've read the Bible because the Bible says that God does allow that. Satan's the one who causes it, but God allows it. Read the book of Job. God just turns him loose. He'll destroy everybody he can if God would allow it. Look at Moses. Look at David. If you think God won't chasten those he loves, you better read the Bible. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth every son he receives. And that word scourge is not the least word in the Bible. That word scourge doesn't mean a little slap on the wrist. He scourges us. And that word scourge is the same one used in John 19, 1, when it says, Pilate scourged Jesus before he crucified him. And you know what happened to him. He was beaten till his back was bloody with whips. You ever do more than slap your child on the wrist or tell him you're going to punish him or discipline him? Well, of course you have. Well, God spanks us. If you've never been spanked by God, you're not his child. Of course, we recognize it depends many times on the seriousness of the offense or your disobedience and how long God's been trying to get your attention by His Spirit or through His anointed ministry or through your reading of the Word. Sometimes it depends on your position of those that much is given. He says of much will be required. He didn't have fish swallowing everybody that disobeyed. So Jonah, Jonah had a tremendous calling and responsibility. What do you think it would be if you had a book in the Bible named after you? So sometimes it depends on the position. But God is going to chasten his children. You're not going to get away from his chastening. I don't care how good you get, you'll still be disciplined. Your child ever get to the place where you no longer ever have to say a word to them? Well, bring them up here after the service. We want to see what an angel looks like. <laughs> Any angels present? We want to see them. But I'll tell you, sometimes God gets very severe. Moses, who is the figure of the Old Testament, God's favorite chosen leader, could not enter the promised land. One sin with his lips. Because he didn't glorify God with his lips. That's why we said a week or two ago, don't glorify Hobart or any ministry here. Glorify God. Thank God for the ministry. See, don't thank the ministry for the ministry. I thank God for you all, Paul says. He was from the South. For you all. <laughs> I thank my God for you upon every remembrance of you. That's good. But he thanks God for you. And I thank God for you. I don't think a day goes by. Well, I want to stay honest. As often as I think of it, I thank God for you. <laughs> Ministerially speaking, every day, but <laughs> being real honest with yourself, whenever I think of it, I thank God for all of you. David had the rebellion of his own house because of his sin. God said, I've forgiven you, but the sword will not depart from your house. His favorite son. Take your favorite child. If you got a favorite one, he had a lot of them, but take your firstborn or whatever. And he turns against you. And he tries to destroy you. That's what Absalom did. And Absalom not only turned against David and usurped the kingship, 
but he perished unsaved and went into a devil's hell, broke his father's heart because David sinned. That's chastisement. God told David that's what it was. He said, I've forgiven you, but you're going to suffer in this life what you will regret the rest of your life. Now that's just the way it is. You can't toy around with these things. If God's trying to get your attention, he'll be mild many times at first. He'll chasten you with words, either from anointed ministry or a brother or sister in the body. If he can't get your attention, he'll wrap you across the knuckles. And I'm not saying he'll do that with everything. I'm just saying some things he will be a little patient with you, trying to get your attention. There are just some things that you're just going to suffer the big things as chastisement from the beginning. See, David couldn't say, well, Lord, this is my first offense. That's all there was. That's all she wrote. Nathan didn't say a word about what David could do or want to do or anything else. He just said, thus saith the Lord, he has forgiven your iniquity. And David repented, of course. But the sword will not depart from your house. You commit adultery, your wives will commit adultery against you in public. So David and Moses and Jonah and Samson lost his strength, then his eyes, then his life. And Peter the apostle, Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church. Not on Peter, but on his statement using the same term, Petros. Peter rebuked publicly because he fell back into legalism as an apostle when he should know better and pulled others away with him. So first of all, God chastens us to confirm our sonship. If you don't have it, then you're not a son. Here's another reason, very important, all of these. They're all in Hebrews 12. I trust you'll go back now and study and see how they apply to your life. Verse 10, he chastens us in order that we might partake of his holiness. Verse 10, God chastens us for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. So if you responded to divine chastisement in those instances when your life or conduct does not measure up to the moral and ethical standards of God, if you respond when your commitment is not what it should be and he begins to chasten, if you respond, then you will be conformed more and more to his holiness through his chastisement. He isn't going to beat you down with it, but he's going to bring you into conformity with his image. You'll partake of his holiness. 1 Peter 1.16, be ye holy for I am holy. Now, God is not going to allow any of his sons, any of his children to take on the image and character of this world. That's why I don't hesitate to tell you if you don't have the fruit of the Spirit, if you don't have the marks of a Christian, you can just mouth, I'm a Christian, I'm a born-again Christian, all you want. And I'll just look you right in the eye and say, you're a liar. Because I've got God's word for it. God is not going to allow these masses of people who grow up in Sunday school and join church and never get really converted to allow them to call themselves his sons or his children. Or well, they may do it, but he doesn't allow it. I'm talking to his sons now, to his children. God will not allow anyone in his family to take on the image or character of this world. He's going to conform you to his holiness because members of a family are supposed to look alike. You can generally tell whose children belong to what parents around here. That's normal, natural. We're supposed to look like God. And I'll tell you, God isn't the only one that despises a worldly-looking Christian. The world hates it. The biggest stigma ever put on the church is they do what we do. They have our interests. They go where we go. What difference is Oh, they go to church occasionally. The reason they can say that is because it's too often true. And so God is not the only one who hates a worldly-looking, professing Christian. The world hates a religious hypocrite above anything else. You either be all the way and they'll respect you, or don't you try to compromise and think you're going to win them that way. That is a devil's lie out of the pit. The only way 
you'll ever win anyone out of this world is to do what Jesus said in Matthew 5, and let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. For ye are the salt of the earth and the light of this world. In Philippians 2, Paul speaks of us being lights in a perverse, darkened world. We shine as lights as we bring forth this word, he says, in a darkened, perverse world. And so God is going to conform us to his image. How does he do it? Chastening isn't pleasant. I never did enjoy getting spanked by my father, my earthly father. Never enjoyed it. But I learned to respect him. You better believe it. And we could get an aside on that and spend 30 minutes on that's what's wrong with the nation today is because there's no discipline, biblical discipline, and therefore the children have no respect for the parents. And then you just go on point two, three, four, five from that. And you could spend 30 minutes just drawing a conclusion from the fact that parents don't discipline their children as they should. They use psychology or bribes or whatever to make them obey or be good, and it doesn't work. Here's another reason why it chastens us, verse 9, in order that we might live and not die. Verse 9, in order that we may live. Furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Well, if they did, properly you respected them. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? And so here we see that God's purpose, thirdly, in chastisement is not to destroy us. Amen. However severe the chastisement, not to destroy us, but in order that we might live, both physically and spiritually. Sometimes, of course, he has to take the life, allow it to be taken, but that's so the spirit will live. But life as it is, whether it's physical or spiritual or both, because if we were left our own ways in this world, let's be honest, many... Sheep would wander and stray, and the enemy would destroy them. And so God keeps them in line. Remember Psalm 23, If I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Oh, that's so comforting. But the next verse, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God has a rod and a staff. You know what the staff is? You know the shepherd's crook? Like a question mark, that's to pull them out of the ravines and so on. But he has a rod, and I know what the rod's for, it's to beat wolves off. But, you know, he can't be fighting too many wolves all the time, or he'd just pen them up. And so the rod can knock a wolf off when he attacks, but I'll tell you what that rod's for. If you want to know what it's for, it's to keep you in line. It's to keep the sheep in line. And you better believe it, a shepherd, he won't hurt his sheep, but he'll keep them in line with that rod. If they don't obey the staff or his voice, then he'll use the rod. The true shepherd carries a rod and a staff, is what we're saying. God isn't going to lose a single one of his sheep. He'll see to it. He'll use the rod on them. From God's side, he will not lose a single sheep because he'll use the rod and the staff. From our side, if we're sheep, he won't lose a single one of us because we will respond to his loving correction, whether it's a rod or a staff. Sometimes the word we bring you is a rod. Sometimes it's a staff. But whatever, you should respond to it because the shepherd loves you. And even when it's severe chastisement over in 1 Corinthians 11, 29 and following, even when it's severe, as we see here in the account of the communion of the bread and cup, even then it's not to destroy us, but in order that he might save us in the end. Now, all that preceded that told how that some were not showing love for one another in the body the way they should. They were being selfish and so on. And in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27, Whosoever shall eat this bread or drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh condemnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now look at verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many die. Now what could be plainer? Because they are not partaking of the communion of the bread and cup in a worthy manner, 
He said, some of you are weak infirmities. Sickly. Sick and diseased. And they can't understand why they don't get healed. And he says, many, not some, not a few, many are dying. That's how important it is on one point. So he goes on to say, though, that isn't to destroy his sheep. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with this world. In other words, God is chastening us so that in the final day of judgment, he won't have to judge us again. He's judging us in the physical realm. Can't be any plainer. Even though they are being deprived of health, they are infirm, and many are dying because of disobedience, he still loves them. So that on the day of judgment, he won't have to judge them with the world. He's going to judge the world with just one yardstick. Guilty. And he's going to judge us too, because the scriptures say that he will. But see, he's going to judge us now for disobedience. And he won't have to then. Well, that's what he said. If you can read, that's what he said. But if you respond to God's correction with the right attitudes, then you'll live. You won't have to have that applied to you weakly, sick, and dying prematurely. I'd like for you to turn to Job 33 because we have a remarkable revelation here of this purpose of chastisement in order that God can spare our lives in this world. Job 33. 14 to 30. A remarkable revelation concerning this purpose of chastisement, so that he can spare our lives. Verse 14, Job 33, For God speaks once, yea, twice, yet man perceives it not. You see, he's trying to get your attention. You speak once, twice, you don't listen. How does he do it? Sometimes in a dream, in a vision at night, when deep sleep falleth upon men and slumberings upon the bed. Then he opens the ears of men and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit by this instruction, and his life from perishing by the sword. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed. First Corinthians 11 said that, didn't it? He is chastened with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain so that his life abhorreth bread and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away and he cannot be seen. His bones that they were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave and his life to the destroyers. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto this man his uprightness, that is what he should do, then he is gracious unto him and saith, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. You see, if someone will tell him the truth and not water it down and compromise it and tell him, you're being chastened, this isn't a trial, here's where you're missing it, and he responds to that, then God says to the destroyer, deliver him. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. See, he's going to be healed. He will return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he shall be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. He looketh upon men and... If any say, I have sinned, you see, if they will not be too proud and admit they've missed it. If they say, I have sinned, I have perverted that which is right, and it profited me not, then he will deliver his soul from going down to the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man. See, oftentimes, chastening oftentimes. Why? Here's the purpose, to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. Yes. Where do you suppose Paul got some of the things he said? Or Jesus, or any of the apostles? Right out of the Revelation in the Old Testament. That's why we say it's so important. This whole passage in Hebrews 12 is a direct quote out of the Old Testament. You'll find it in Proverbs. Here's another purpose for which God chastens us, and we shouldn't resist it but submit to it, and that's verse 11. To produce righteousness in us. Now that's not the same as holiness. Holiness has to do with our character. You do righteousness. And so to produce right living in us. Verse 11. For no chastening for the present seemeth joyous but grievous. That's obvious. No one enjoys being chastened. 
Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness in them which are exercised thereby. That is, if they submit to it. He's already said that if you don't submit, you're not a son. Well, to put it in simple terms, God chastens us to make us good. Why do you discipline your children? Because they're good? No, to make them good. If there's any way God can make us good, He's going to do it. Now, it doesn't have to be chastening, but let's face it. He says it will be sometimes. God repeatedly says, I want you to be righteous. I want you to be good. Do good works so men will glorify your Father. Do good to one another. When they do evil to you, do good back to them. Do good. Don't just pray for your enemies. He says, do good to them. That's in Matthew 5. So if chastening produces righteousness in you, then you're a son. It's proof again of your sonship. I've got a passage over in 1 John 3, verse 10, in which you can tell if you're a son by your righteousness or lack of it. 1 John 3.10, And this the children of God are made manifest. In what? The children of God are made manifest, and the children of the devil. In this, here's the test, Whosoever doeth not righteousness is a child of the devil, is not of God. 1 John 3.10. In chapter 2 he said, Beloved, we are the sons of God. And he says, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as Jesus is pure. He said, you can tell if you're a son of God or a son of the devil. By the way, for people who believe in the fatherhood of God, they have trouble with passages like this because the devil is the father of the world. As someone said, you're either a saint or you ain't. And if you're an ain't, then you're a child of the devil. So the fruit of righteousness is the result of chastisement if you're a son of God. He says it bears this peaceable fruit of righteousness in them that are exercised by the chastisement. Jesus said in John 15, you must prune a tree if you want it to bear fruit. And if you want to bear more fruit, you prune it more. And if you want to bear much fruit, you prune it even more. And that's quite painful. If God had any other way besides chastening, He'd still use chastening. That's right. Same reason you do. If you have any other way, you still end up chastening them. Any parent here that doesn't chasten his child, you really need help. Now, I'm not saying you don't use other methods, but I don't care how many other methods you use, you still end up chastening them. If they've done wrong, it's some form of chastisement. If you're a right parent. Even if it's, well, after you do your lessons, go to bed. You didn't have to use physical chastisement. I'm talking about if there was any other method, God would still use chastening. Because He says He does. He says, I open your ear. I speak to you in vision and dreams. I send you teachers. But he still chastens. Because he said, if you are without chastisement, you're not my child. Oh yes, he speaks to you through the word, through the anointed word, through your reading the word. But he's still going to chasten you for the same reason you chasten your children. But see, the sad part is, so many Christians don't know what God's doing. We're back to where we started, that... Chastening will not fulfill its purpose unless you recognize that it's chastening. If you think it's a trial, why, oh, this trial. I hope I get through that and then God can't get your attention and eventually He just goes off and leaves you alone or does something that will get your attention. But the point is you don't profit from that lesson because you never see its chastisement. Some people will moan and groan about the trials they're going through and if you examine their case history, as it were, you can tell them right away, you're being chastened. Or they will think they're being persecuted for righteousness sake when they're just too proud and stubborn to admit they're wrong about something. So you have to know if it's a trial, chastening, or temptation. How can you tell between a trial and chastisement? Well, let me give you some guidelines, two or three things here. How can you tell if it's a trial or chastisement? Generally, it's easy. I marvel at some of the questions I get from people 
that is so obvious and in the middle of the conversation then they'll say well I've got resentment against brother so and so you suppose that's why God is not answering my prayer maybe I should give up my critical spirit you suppose that would hinder it I said I would guarantee that it would <laughs> they don't really have to talk to you I don't know why they do it's not hard to tell if it's a trial or chastisement if you sincerely search for the answer If you're undergoing severe financial problem, a physical trial, if things are not going the way they should, if you failed in something that you were sure there was no reason that God wouldn't bless it, why don't you just take the time to do what some won't do, get alone with yourself and God, and ask Him. Examine your heart. See if there be any wicked way in you. See if there's something wrong. See if there's something to be revealed to you in an area of disobedience or sin or just failure to do what you know you should do. A lack of obedience. Say with the psalmist in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, we could erase a lot of the problems right there that people have. If they would just examine their hearts, they would quit feeling sorry for themselves because they're going through this awful trial and recognize it for what it is, chastening by a loving Father. He can't get your attention any other way, through the Word or whatever, so He's chastening you. I can almost guarantee you, unless you need mental help, and you know, I don't suppose anybody here does, mental help, Unless you're mentally deficient, it's not hard to tell if it's a trial or chastisement. I can remember the times my loving Father spanked me, and I mean my Heavenly Father. If you don't have those experiences, I really do feel sorry for you. They're not pleasant, but I'll tell you, you love Him the more for it, because it's proof you're His Son. But I can't offhand recall any time that He spanked me, I had to ask Him what it was for. I knew right away. I didn't have to even do what I'm telling you to do, get alone with God. But I tell you that because some people don't slow down long enough from worrying and feeling sorry for themselves they're going through this awful trial to find out if it is a trial. I don't feel that I'm that much smarter or any smarter than anybody that I didn't have to ask the Lord, what is this? <laughs> I always said, I hear you, Lord, and you're faithful. Thank you for it. Oh, it hurts, but thank you. And it isn't always physical. Well, you say, man, I've never had that kind of relationship with my Heavenly Father where I would thank Him for spanking me. Well, maybe you're not His child. Because He says, you respected your earthly father when He chastened you. Well, maybe you didn't, but the point is well taken that how much more should you respect the chastening of your Heavenly Father so that you can live as a result of it. So, the first guideline to know whether it's a trial or temptation is generally it's going to be clear. If you sincerely search your own heart, you'll know whether it's a trial or chastening. Here's another thing. What's the opinion of other saints? That is to say, I'm not saying go ask somebody, but has someone in the body who's spiritual? Now, of course, we're all spiritual. But I recognize sometimes people can tell you something you ought to straighten up, and they've got worse problems than you. And so you generally don't want to heed that kind of advice. But has some spiritual brother or sister in the body pointed out something to you about your doctrine or belief or attitude or that you're missing God somewhere, that you're not walking in the light He's given you? Have they pointed out something to you? You see, the temptation is for you to ignore that and try to justify yourself, which is generally what most do. Oh, who's he or she? They're just flesh like I am. And how about that time he or she had to be helped? And so you miss God. He can't get your attention through the Word, so He's trying to send one of your loving brothers or sisters to you. And I certainly don't think we should be running around looking for things to correct in the body. I didn't say that. But if God can't get your attention the other way, and you don't know if it's a trial or chastisement, what's the opinion of the spiritual members of the body? Have they said anything to you? Has the pastor said anything to you through the Word? Now, it's easy to shrug that off and say, well, I'm misunderstood, or he's not talking to me. 
That means your pride's bigger than your desire to change. That's all that means. I've met a few like that that have bigger pride than they do a willingness to change. I can think of cases for anything I say. Try to correct a brother about a doctrine and just religious pride, he wouldn't listen. I've met people that you say, you're missing God, that's sin, that isn't ethical. Some people don't even know the difference between a lie and sin. They think that a lie is justified. I received a letter just recently where they were lying to their parents. The end justifies the means. They were telling them a lie and felt that justified them because they didn't want to hurt their feelings about something. So if you will search your heart, and if no one has been trying to deal with you about it, whether it's over the pulpit, in the Word, or some spiritual brother or sister, and you've been ignoring that, if after you've examined your heart, you don't see any place you need to be admonished about this situation, then accept it as a trial of your faith. I mean, people, they've been somewhere else, and they'll come get my opinion. You think this is a trial, or is God trying to talk to me? And then you have to take 30 minutes or an hour to go through all the details, try to even make a decision, which isn't the way to do it, of course. If after you have sincerely examined your own heart, and I'm assuming you already know you're a child of God, and not just to put on religious figure, so you'll never get the truth that way, but you've sincerely examined your heart, and there's nothing there. You're not saying you're perfect, but there's nothing there that you're not doing that you should do, or you're doing what you should do. Take it as a trial. Why worry about it? I tell people, quit worrying. Sounds like a trial to me. Why are you worrying? They say, well, I've examined my heart. I've prayed, I've fasted, I've done all this. Well, I say, then quit worrying. Accept it as a trial of your faith. And because you've told God if he's trying to say anything you want him to show you, he will. If it isn't a trial, he'll be the first to tell you because he's trying to get your attention if it isn't a trial. So don't worry. You see, we can learn through trials as well as chastisements. Trials mature our faith. That's what they're for. Trials will mature, improve your faith, and chastisement will improve your faith. James 1, he says, The trying of your faith will work in you endurance. The trying of your faith. He says, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials, not temptations, as King James. But trials, knowing the trying of your faith, is working in you endurance. So you can endure till the end. So trials prove your faith. Chastisements improve your faithfulness. They both have their place. And thus, we see that God has three, not just one, but He has three methods of training us in discipleship. The Holy Spirit is training us to endure a trial, overcome a temptation, Submit lovingly, willingly to loving chastisement. Now it comes as news to a lot of people. It shouldn't be news to us here because we've said it too many ways too many times. But the world is not a place to camp out in. It's a furnace for Christians. It's a place where God, with these three methods, disciplines you and brings you into the position of a disciple. You know, discipline, disciple, the words are kind of similar. They're intended to be. So the world is a furnace. The world is not a place where Christians are trying to escape from. It's a furnace. It's a training ground, a proving ground for disciples. That's why Jesus said in John 17, Father, I pray not that you take them out of the world. Now isn't that interesting? How many have never seemed to have read that? He prayed that God would not take us out of this furnace, this testing and proving ground. Till sometimes you wonder how much longer you can endure a trial. He said, I pray not you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You know, people are always coming up to me or writing me and they said, Brother, I want to go deeper with the Lord. They say, I've read your deeper life book. I've heard the tapes on end time ministry and deeper life. Brother, I want to go deeper with the Lord. I want to be an overcomer. Brother, I want this and that. Brother, I'm going to be an overcomer. And they mean well. I'm not criticizing them. At least they think they mean what they say while they're saying it. But they forget sometimes God's listening too. It isn't just Hobart. 
And so he takes them at their word, and he heats that old furnace 10 to 20 degrees hotter, and then, oh my, Lord, this isn't Job. My name's John or whatever. Lord, this isn't Job. Everybody thinks only Job could have Job's trials. So God takes them at their word, and so when they get into trouble because of their strong stand on faith with their families and the authorities and the media, when they're undergoing a financial trial that, oh, that mountain looks bigger than even God can meet that amount of money, when they're suffering some crisis, when husband or wife threatens to leave because of your faith fanaticism or talking in tongues or whatever, then they suddenly discovered that furnace is a little bit hotter than they thought, and well, I'll just get out of here until things cool down a little, and then whew, maybe next time I'll be able to endure it. My friend, you're going to have to make up your mind. God is not going to give you privileged people, and you are privileged. We are privileged, and let the devil make of that what he will. I couldn't care less. God is not going to allow much longer some of you to sit under anointed word. Had one just called me this week. The word's too strong, so he had to leave. I got him to admit he was wrong, that the word was too strong. Yeah, that's right. First, he didn't agree with us, and then finally, I got him to admit, well, the word was too strong. Recently, I preached that if you don't submit to the word, and what God's trying to say to you, he'll start talking in parables. So this man, whoever he was, it doesn't make any difference. He can no longer understand what we're saying. It doesn't line up with his mentality. So the only thing you do is leave. Well, I said everywhere you go, if there's a word, you'll be in trouble. And he finally admitted, yes, I've got a problem. Pray for me. I said, no, I won't pray for you. I'll pray that God, as you submit to him, will open your eyes so he can see you. Well, that's a whole sermon in itself. The average minister right away, well, let's pray. Well, if he wants to do what's right, then get out there and sit in that empty seat there with a pencil and paper and start listening to the Lord. What I'm saying is this, you're going to have to make up your mind pretty soon. Now, you can accept this as Hobart or the Lord. I can't make your choice for you. Who's talking? You're going to have to make up your mind pretty soon that you're going to have to have as much faith in God to supply you with $60,000 or $100,000 as you say you have in Him already to supply your daily bread. And those who can't have that kind of faith, God's going to pass them by. Why, the least worry God has, if He had any, is financial. If you have a need of $100,000 or $50,000 or whatever, we're talking about faith. That's between you and God. You take it to Him. Like George Mueller. He prayed down the equivalent of millions of dollars and never told anybody his needs but God. And one brother, I ministered with him. He said, we got, what was it, a million? A million dollars. He said he never told anybody but God. For the Lord's work. I don't know why people, they can sit here for months and years and think it won't work. As soon as you have financial trial, you don't have to bring it to the body and say, well, pray for us, stand with us, we're believing God. You just believe God for yourself. This is an end time work here. We can't keep holding you up. If you need help, you come up here. I'll give you 20, whatever you need. We got no problems about helping people. That isn't what we're saying. If you've been here over three weeks, you should already know how to get $20. Amen. Honestly. <laughs> and without begging and pleading God for it. Oh, it was a pleasure all of those years in college and seminary not to have income and just watch God supply it. Put the food on the table. Mother Hubbard's cupboard, bear. He'd put the food on the table. Never missed a meal. Amen. Amen. Wouldn't know what it would be to have a worry financially. You're going to have to have that kind of faith because remember, you disqualify yourself in this end time move if you can't trust God for your material needs. That is basic. He doesn't move on from Matthew 6, 19 to 34. Until you can handle that, you can't go anywhere with God. Take no thought. Five times he says it. And if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which means seek only that, then he says, 
I'll take thought for all of your needs. I'll give you all the things that you're seeking after and you can't get. So we're going to have to make up our mind in a hurry that we're going to have as much confidence in Him to supply whatever we need as well as those daily pieces of bread. You say, well, I can believe Him for that. And you're going to have to have as much confidence in God that your enemies, whether it's the media, the authorities, the neighbors, the devil's agents, whoever, you're going to have to have as much faith in God that they cannot harm one hair of your head, even when they seem to be swarming all over you because of your faith, foolishness, and refusal to compromise, as you say you have when, you know, when you're not going through a trial. You're just going to have to believe that they can't touch you. Oh, well, Paul ended up in prison. I didn't say you wouldn't. If people would just get their eyes open to the fact that Jesus said that the very hairs of your head are numbered, and he said, not only won't you perish, but he said, not even a hair of your head will be harmed. Praise God. That means more to some maybe than others, but <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Well, he was just making a point. He wasn't talking about if you're bald or not. You remember some time ago, God gave us a message, and we concluded that particular message about he's going to hold you responsible for all those confessions of faith you make in your little songs and courses? Yeah. He is. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I have proved him o'er and o'er. People say that and they've never proven him. They don't trust him about anything. All of those songs, great is thy faithfulness, and they don't trust God. I'm standing on the promises when they're really sitting down on them. Well, we won't preach that sermon again, but remember, God's going to hold you to confessions of faith. And God is allowing the trials and sending the chastisements because He loves you. He's preparing you. The deeper life is what He's trying to get you into by giving you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a threshold experience, not an end in itself. And the deeper life is not getting to a place where you can escape from trial and these tests and chastisements, the deeper life is going deeper in the furnace. It's not getting out, it's going deeper. Now you know why some don't go all the way with God. The deeper life is not getting out of trials. The deeper life is old self getting buried deeper in that grave. The deeper life means you go deeper with God than the average Christian would even think that he should go in a thousand years. And his methods, trials, and a lying temptation so he can overcome them, and chastisements. Those are his three methods. He's going to get the job done. He loves you. Amen. Salvation won't cost you a thing, but Jesus said discipleship will cost you everything you have. And I suppose that's why that so many people emphasize the one and not the other. Now let's be honest with ourselves, all we've heard, all I've ever heard, on rare occasions, there would be exceptions of course, is about salvation, the saviorhood of Jesus. We've been stressing this the last few weeks, but we don't hear about discipleship and lordship. It's easy to get people to make a commitment to Jesus as savior and then go on living their own lives, but a disciple taking up the cross, oh that's going to cost them everything. Salvation won't cost you a thing, but discipleship will cost you everything. And because Christians have only heard half a gospel where they've divided saviorhood from lordship, they're only believing half a gospel. And Jesus said they're not saved. It's that serious. If only I believed it, it would still be true. You can't separate saviorhood from lordship in the New Testament. You show me the verse where you can. Salvation will cost you nothing, but discipleship will cost you everything. And you can't separate discipleship from salvation. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And that's what man has been doing. He's severing God's saviorhood, telling people to accept Jesus, and you see what results from that. People who can't even 
believe their way out of a wet paper bag in the rain. They wouldn't be able to find their way out. They wouldn't have the faith for it. But disciples who die out to self can believe for anything. Deeper life training and discipleship. It isn't pleasant. The flesh doesn't like it. But your spirit is in love with it. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Spirit of the living God. open your heart and let him fill it with his presence. We ask you to come down, Lord, in a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your people. Anoint our hearts with this word in your presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah.